Hi, my name is Ann Bevan. I'm the lymphoma lead at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And today I'm gonna to be talking about standard regimens and novel agents for mantle cell lymphoma. So how we treat our patients with mantle cell lymphoma, of course, depends on how they present. So the median age for mantle cell lymphoma diagnosis is about 65 years, which means that there's lots of patients who are gonna be into their 70s or even into their early 80s who are new diagnosis for mantle cell lymphoma. So the aggressive therapy that we usually recommend for mantle cell lymphoma may not be appropriate for these patients. Same thing for a patient who has lots of comorbidities and functional status issues. Or if a patient presents with limited stage disease, so 20% of mantle cell lymphoma will actually be a stage one or two. And for these patients, we typically will approach with a less aggressive therapy followed by radiation. We all know that there's some mantle cell lymphoma that is very indolent, almost more like a CLL approach is taken with these patients where we can observe for some time before therapy um, is required. And then of course, the other thing we need to know when deciding how to treat our patients, is this a new diagnosis, upfront therapy? Is this relapsed or refractory? And if they are relapsed or refractory, what treatments have they gotten in the past? So I've already hinted at it a little bit, but for patients who are young and healthy, we tend to take a very aggressive approach to treatment of our patients with mantle cell lymphoma. So this looks at um, a review done by the NCCN. They looked back at their database of how patients have been treated and how they did with their mantle cell lymphoma. And what you can see is that patients who got aggressive therapy, whether that was just our hep receivat by itself, our hep receivat with transplant, or even our CHOP followed by stem cell transplant, all did equally well. Whereas the patients who just got our CHOP, which is the lower line, did not do as well in terms of progression-free survival, although there was not a clear difference in overall survival. And of course, this is retrospective data. So there could be other issues going into why some patients were chosen to be just given our CHOP therapy that could be impacting these results. When we think about aggressive therapy, there's a lot of different chemotherapy regimens that can be used. I just listed them here. I'm not gonna go into the individual data for each of these regimens since we don't have that much time in our talk today. But some of the things are alternating RCHOP, RDHAP, the Nordic regimen, r receivad or a BR regimen followed by a rituximab cytarabine. But a common theme you'll see is that cytarabine is often something that we use in treatment of newly diagnosed mantle cell lymphoma. And our goal is to proceed to an autologous stem cell transplant. And there actually is good data showing us that autologous stem cell transplant is beneficial in mantle cell lymphoma. So this study was done where they took patients who were treated with RCHOP chemotherapy. And those patients who were responders were then randomized to interferon versus autologous stem cell transplant. And what you can see here is that those patients who got autologous stem cell transplant had a significant improvement in not only progression-free survival, but also overall survival. And as you can see from these graphs, which go out to the five or six year range, that this was a durable benefit that was seen. The problem of course, is that not all of our patients are going to be candidates for this aggressive therapy. And for them, we need to think about what are our other options. So our bendamustine is something that's frequently used. Our CHOP is less frequently used as frontline therapy for mantle cell lymphoma, partly based on some of this data right here. So there were two studies, the STILL trial and the BRIGHT trial, that compared arbendamustine to RCHOP. This was in indolent lymphomas, but they also included patients with newly diagnosed mantle cell lymphoma. The data here is just for those patients with mantle cell lymphoma. And what they saw was that the overall response rate is fairly similar between these two regimens in about 90%, and the CR rate perhaps a little bit higher with arbendamustine. In the trials, they reported 40 to 50% CR with arbendamustine versus 27 and 30% with the RRCHOP RCVP regimens. But the STILL trial has given us uh, some more data. They actually presented the progression-free survival for the mantle cell lymphoma patients. And you can see here that the progression-free survival was more than doubled with r and this was highly statistically significant and clinically meaningful going from 31 months to 69 months. And what's even better is that the regimen that gave us the longer progression-free survival is also the regimen that seems to be better tolerated. As you can see, serious adverse events in the STILL trial of 19% versus 29% in the RCHOP. But there's lots of other regimens that we can be used. Another regimen that's frequently used in frontline therapy for mantle cell lymphoma is lenalidomide and rituximab. So this is a small study, but gave us a lot of good data about lenalidomide in the first line setting. So this study took patients with untreated mantle cell lymphoma uh, with a goal of low and intermediate risk patients, but they also included high MP MP patients who had 
who are not eligible for chemotherapy, aggressive chemotherapy and transplant. And these patients were treated initially with rituximab and lenalidomide. It was started at a dose of 20 milligrams per day on days one through 21, and was then with a goal of increasing to 25 milligrams per day. After a year of therapy, patients were transitioned to maintenance where the goal lenalidomide dose was 15 milligrams per day on days one to 21 of a 28 day cycle. And patients were to continue as long as it was tolerated until progressive disease. And as you can see here, the response rates were quite good. So this attention to treat analysis was done on 36 patients. Two patients couldn't be assessed for response because they got off study early because of significant tumor flare when they started the lenalidomide. But for those patients who did have response assessment, the overall response rate was 87% and the complete response rate was 61%. Median time to partial response was three months and the median time to CR was 11 months. And as you can see here, some patients didn't get into a complete remission until almost two years on therapy. And I think this is very important to remember when you're treating your patients with lenalidomide that as long as they're tolerating it well and aren't having significant progression disease, it's reasonable to continue them on this treatment as you may get later, uh, deeper responses. And we now have much longer follow-up data available showing that these responses are durable. So an estimated five-year progression-free survival of 64% and five-year overall survival estimated at 77%. But I think when we're talking about lenalidomide and rituximab, it's more important to talk about kind of tolerability than it is for some of our regimens like bendamustine rituximab or RCHOP, which are only given for four and a half or six months, because these are drugs that patients could conceivably be taking lenalidomide and rituximab for years. So I wanted to include this data here. And what you can see is that many patients did get dose reductions of their lenalidomide. During the induction phase, a third of patients were able to get up to the goal of 25 milligrams on days one through 21. But 42% of patients had to dose reduce to a dose of 15 milligrams or less. And this is perhaps even more pronounced in the maintenance regimen where the goal was 15 milligrams on days one to 21. And as you can see, 70% of patients were only able to tolerate a dose of 10 milligrams or less of the lenalidomide. And looking at the 16 patients who remained in remission at three or more years, about half of them were able to continue on the lenalidomide and rituximab. As you can see, seven were just on single agent rituximab and a couple just on lenalidomide. As far as the specific toxicities, grade three or four neutropenia um, was quite common in induction and maintenance, although febrile neutropenia was rare. Grade three or four thrombocytopenia, perhaps a bit more at the higher dose of the lenalidomide that was used on induction, as was rash. In lenalidomide, we always wanna think about secondary malignancies, and they did see 16% of patients getting a secondary malignancy. Fortunately, these were mostly non-invasive skin cancers, but there was one Merkel cell and one pancreatic cancer, and these were diagnosed um, between 12 and 18 months after starting the lenalidomide rituximab. Then, of course, we need to talk about bortezomib as this was one of the first agents that was FDA approved specifically for relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. The initial approval was as a single agent, and certainly this still could be used as an option in a patient who's failed multiple other therapies. But most of the time, if someone's going to use bortezomib, it really now is in a combination with other drugs. So this is a randomized control trial that compared VR-CAP to RCHOP. So the VR-CAP was really just taking the vincristine and replacing it with bortezomib. This was for newly diagnosed patients who were transplant ineligible. And you can see, again, good overall response rate, about 90% in both regimens, perhaps a little bit of a higher CR rate in the VR cap, but we don't have um, significant data on that. But the median overall survival with long-term follow-up is very different between these two regimens, with a median overall survival of 90 months in the VR cap arm versus 56 months in the RCHOP arm. Um, as far as peripheral neuropathy, this is the thing that we see most commonly with bortezomib and vincristine. The incidence was about the same in the two regimens with perhaps a little bit more grade three, four neuropathy in the bortezomib containing regimen at 8% versus 4%. So if you send, do your patient aggressive therapy and send them to autologous stem cell transplant or you use less aggressive therapy, the question comes up, should you give them maintenance rituximab? And there actually is data looking at this specifically in several instances. So data shows an overall survival benefit of maintenance rituximab after induction therapy with RCHOP as well as after autologous stem cell transplant. So the RCHOP data comes from a trial that had two randomizations. So the initial randomization was for patients to get RCHOP versus FCR, so flodearabine containing regimen. Those patients who had a PR or CR were then randomized again to maintenance rituximab versus observation. And what they found was that in subgroup analysis, so when they looked at those patients who got RCHOP and had a response and then were randomized, 
those patients did have a significantly improved overall survival with maintenance rituximab, with a median overall survival of almost 10 years versus seven years, which is the observation. When they looked at the patients who got FCR and had a response and then were randomized to maintenance rituximab or observation, they did not see a survival benefit. Similarly, after autologous stem cell transplant, when patients are randomized to observation versus maintenance rituximab, you can see again a four-year overall survival benefit of 89% versus 80%. There has been randomized data looking at maintenance rituximab after bendamustine rituximab, and this case did not show any overall survival or progression-free survival benefit. So at this time, it is reasonable if a patient got RCHOP or an autologous stem cell transplant to continue with maintenance rituximab. Uh, the data for doing so in bendamustine rituximab is not as uh, in support of doing this. So perhaps you take your patient through aggressive therapy and transplant, and then they, the problem is that most of them will still relapse at some point, or you might even have some patients that have refractory disease. So I think we need to talk about what our options are at that time. And there are many options that have come available over recent years. So the Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, just last year, CAR T therapy. Then of course, other options are frontline therapeutic options that you didn't use already. So you know, if you didn't use bortezomib, you could use that, or bendamustine or lenalidomide. But I think at this time, most people, rather than just going to more cytotoxic chemotherapy, will go down um, the route probably of a BTK inhibitor. So there are three Bruton tires and kinase inhibitors that are FDA approved for relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma. A Brutinib was the first one, and this showed initial response of an overall response rate of 66% and a CR rate of 20%, with a median progression free survival of 13 months. A calibrutinib and xanabrutinib were subsequently approved, with the data showing here with overall response rates of 80% and CR reported of 40% in the calibrutinib and 69% in the xanabrutinib trials with progression-free survivals of about 20 months to 22 months. But these were three different studies. These were not directly comparing the drugs. So you need to take this with a little bit of a grain of salt. For example, if you look at the brutinib regimen, it a median of three prior therapies. So these are patients that might have been less likely to get into a response versus two prior therapies for a calibrutinib and xanabrutinib. Or what's the response modality? The Brutinib studies use CT scan results. So it's possible that the CR rate is underreported in this group because they didn't use PET, PET imaging. Because BTK inhibitors are things that are at this point continued indefinitely until disease progression or not tolerated, it's again important to talk about what are the toxicities that we see. So in the same three trials that I just discussed, in the Brutinib regimen, they just had reported 50% of any grade of diarrhea and 6% grade three or four. And even in the calibrutinib and xanabrutinib, although perhaps less diarrhea, we're still seeing significant amounts. I think it's important to point out that grade one and two diarrhea is still significant diarrhea. So if you remember, grade one diarrhea is up to three bowel movements over your normal baseline. Grade two is four to six over normal baseline. So that's certainly something that could really impact people's lives. Grade three to four neutropenia and 10 to 20% of patients in these drugs. The big issues we've talked about frequently with ibrutinib were grade three to four AFib, so 5% of patients, and then major bleeding episodes in 5% of patients. The calibrutinib and xanabrutinib, which are more targeted kinase inhibitors, do seem to have less of these issues. So in these early studies, they didn't report any grade three or four AFib and certainly had much less major bleeding episodes. So none of these drugs have been directly compared to each other for mantle cell lymphoma therapy. Ibrutinib and xanabrutinib, however, have been compared in a trial for Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia. And they did not show any difference in efficacy between the brutinib and xanabrutinib in that disease population, but they did see difference in toxicities. And there were the differences that we would have expected. So with the xanabrutinib arm, they saw less diarrhea, they saw less cardiac events, less major bleeding. Almost every toxicity was less, except for the grade three, four neutropenia, which was more in xanabrutinib, although they did not see more febrile neutropenia episodes. So another thing that we always have to talk about in, CAR -T, in lymphoma treatment is CAR-T therapy. So happily in 2020, we had our first CAR-T FDA approved for relapsed refractory mantle cell lymphoma. And this is very exciting data. So this study looked at patients with a median age of 65 and a median of three prior therapies. 100% of them had had prior BTK inhibitors and almost half of them had, had prior autologous stem cell transplant. So these were very heavily pretreated patients. So the response rate of 93% and even more exciting, that complete response rate of 67% is really encouraging. And here you can see the data for the progression-free survival and overall survival, um, which is also very nice to see. And what, what is of interest in the progression-free survival group is we see something very similar to what we're seeing with a lot of the CAR-T, 
regimens, which is that people relapse early. And once they get out, in this case, out at beyond about a year, these remissions seem to be durable. Um, of course, we need longer follow-up to see how good they will be. So future questions that we need to think about are, should BTK inhibitors be part of frontline therapy? What's the duration of treatment with oral agents with lenalidomide or BTK inhibitors? Do we really need to continue these indefinitely until the disease progression? Or in patients who have the deepest response, can we stop them at some point, similar to what we do now with CML? And this gets onto the role of minimal residual disease testing. Is this something that can direct our therapies? Can people who have minimal residual disease negative um, testing have their oral agents stopped? And then there's other novel agents that are being studied for the treatment of mantle cell lymphoma, BCL2 inhibitors, antibody drug conjugates, PI3 kinase inhibitors, and of course, another generation of BTK inhibitors. And there are several randomized studies going on right now, um, looking at BTK inhibitors as frontline therapy, either um, in combination with chemotherapy, as you see with BR and BR cytarabine regimens here, or um, just with rituximab and compared directly to a chemotherapy regimen. So it'll be some years before we have the response to this, but um, these are gonna be very exciting studies to get the results from. So venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, has a little bit of data for single agent use and relapse refractory mantle cell lymphoma with one study showing a PR of 75% and a CR of 21%. So potentially something that could be used in a patient who's relapsed after multiple other therapies. But where I think this is most likely to become a part of mantle cell lymphoma therapy is in combination with other regimens such as a BTK inhibitor um, or, and a CD20 monoclonal antibody. It's been studied with other combinations as well, but I thought this data was quite interesting and these are some of the studies that are farthest along. So this particular study of venetoclax abritinib and venetuzumab was a phase one or two study and it included patients who were newly diagnosed as well as patients with relapse disease. So the responses reported here were after patients had been on the drug for six cycles. And what you can see is that for the previously untreated patients, the CR rate was extraordinarily high at 87% with a one-year progression free survival of 93%. But even for the relapse mantle cell lymphoma, the results were encouraging with a CR rate of 67% and one-year progression free survival of 75%. Um, in the the Nidoclax study that I was just talking about, they did take about 12 patients who were in the previously untreated mantle cell lymphoma group, and they found that those were, that they tested, all of them were MRD negative. And that's what we're seeing more and more, that as we get these deeper um, therapies, we find more patients are getting MRD negative. And we have shown that MRD negativity is associated with better prognosis. So the European mantle cell lymphoma intergroup studies of our chemotherapy, they looked back at several of their studies and looked at MRD testing. They found that 67% of elderly patients were MRD negative after our chemotherapy. And perhaps more exciting was they found that this did correlate with outcomes. So the patients who were MRD negative after our chemo, 77% of them were in an ongoing remission at two years, in contrast to only 34% who were MRD positive after our chemotherapy. So there's a very interesting intergroup study that's going on, EA4151 at this time, that is seeing whether we can use MRD testing to direct therapy. So this study takes patients who, after they've gotten induction therapy, those patients who have a partial response or MRD positive CR all go into autologous stem cell transplant. But the patients who are MRD negative CR after induction are randomized either to autologous stem cell transplant followed by maintenance rituximab or just to maintenance rituximab. So this study is enrolling really well, but it's still going to be a number of years before we have results. So in summary, there's many new therapeutic options, um, but many ongoing questions. How long do we need to continue treatment? Which drugs should, drugs should we be using as first-line therapy? How is minimal residual disease testing going to guide next steps? And so I think we've had an exciting few years with lots of new drugs approved for mantle cell lymphoma, and I'm looking forward to more advances in the coming years. Thank you.